Well, good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome. Tonight we come to you from our botany class, and so a warm welcome to our groups in Waikato and uh, Green Lane, of course, and Christchurch. And a special welcome uh, to those watching via YouTube. Uh, great to have you all with us. So tonight we, we look at two miracles of Jesus as recorded in the Gospel of John and the feeding of the 5,000 and Jesus walking on water. And both these miracles point to the sovereign power of Jesus to provide and to protect. They demonstrate that Jesus was fully divine as well as fully human. And so the hymn that we have tonight uh, is one that also praises God for his sovereign power and provision. So let's start by standing and singing uh, praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is Thy health and salvation. All ye who hear, now to His temple draw near, seeing now Praise to the Lord who are all things so wondrously reigneth, who was on wings of an eagle uplifteth, sustaineth. Has thou not seen how thy desires all have been granted in he ordaineth. Praise to the Lord who hath fearfully, wondrously made thee. Health hath vouchsafed, and when heedlessly falling hath stayed thee. What need or grief ever of his mercy did shade thee. Praise to the Lord who doth prosper thy work and defend thee, who from the heavens and streams of his mercy doth not send thee. Ponder can do who with his love doth befriend thee praise to the Lord oh let all that is in me adore him all that hath life and breath come now with praises before him let the Amen sound from His people again. Gladly for I we adore Him. Well, thank you to Stephen and to Ruel for the playing and the leading. Let's uh, pray as we come around God's word. Heavenly Father, in your sovereignty, you reveal your divine nature and your sovereign control. And yet we see in these two miracles that even in your sovereignty, you look to provide and protect your people. We see that the little that we contribute, 
you can turn into abundance. And we see that we can always rely on your presence and protection. So, Lord, will you help us focus on you? And as we do that, help us to walk the path that you would have us follow. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we continue our study of John's Gospel this week looking at chapter 6. And we have two signs or miracles that really I think are the dividing point for this passage. So two divisions. Verses 1 to 15, Jesus sovereignly provides food for the multitude. And verses 16 to 21, Jesus sovereignly provides protection for the disciples. So we see Jesus sovereignly providing food for the multitudes in the first 15 verses, and then Jesus sovereignly providing protection for the disciples. And our big idea flowing from these divisions is that Jesus' sovereignty makes him our complete provider. Jesus' sovereignty makes him our complete provider. And our basic truth, that age-old question, who is God? So we're going to look at two miracles in which Jesus demonstrates his sovereign or divine power. Now, humanity tends to use power to exert its will over others. But Jesus, who has unlimited power, does things very differently. He demonstrates his power by provision, by providing for a hungry multitude and by protecting his disciples from a storm. You see, Jesus is not interested in our wants. He's looking at our needs and in particular, our spiritual needs. And what we see in these two miracles is that we struggle to see our spiritual needs because we are overwhelmed by our physical wants or desires. Our desire to satisfy our physical can become so great that it drowns out our ability to look objectively at our spiritual needs. And the mistake the crowd and the disciples make, and it's also a mistake that we make, is to look to the world to supply our physical and spiritual wants, only to be disappointed. If you want true and absolute security that you will be provided for, then your only option is to look to Jesus. So let's open our Bibles to John chapter 6. And we start the chapter in Galilee. And from Mark's gospel, we know the disciples had just returned from their first mission trip. And Jesus was very keen to spend some quiet time alone with them, to rest and to catch up on their experiences. So they head off by boat across the Sea of Galilee. But they are spotted, and very quickly a large crowd starts to follow them. And we see Jesus asking Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Now Philip was from the town of Bethsaida, which was nearby. So actually, he was a logical person to ask, as he would know the area. But it's really a bit of a leading question that Jesus asks, because by asking, where shall we buy bread? He's almost directing Philip's thinking to obtaining food by earthly means. 
And Jesus is very practical in his, and sorry, Philip is very practical in his reply. He says it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one just to have a bite. So Philip cannot really see an answer to this problem. And Jesus is testing Philip's faith with his question. Because so far in John's gospel, we've seen that the disciples tend to think physically rather than spiritually. And just, just like us, they get caught up in the practicalities when they really need to be thinking spiritually. And Jesus here is prompting Philip and the other disciples to look beyond the physical to the spiritual. How often do we get caught up in the practicalities and forget God altogether or forget how much God can do? And how often do we not share when the amount that we have seems far too small in our eyes? So then Andrew steps up saying, here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? So Andrew also cannot really see an answer to the problem, but he is prepared to offer what he has available. Andrew is not deterred by the meager amount of food that he has found. He's still prepared to bring it to Jesus. Now, if this was me, I'd feel embarrassed at bringing such a small amount when the need is clearly so immense. If this was me, I'd just say, nah, this is crazy. I'm not even going to bother offering it. So I think Andrew shows real guts because he's risking a whole lot of sarcastic remarks and yet he still steps up. And there's a third person involved here, the boy. The feeding of the multitude is the only miracle of Jesus that is recorded in all four gospel accounts. And John is the only one who records that the loaves and the fish came from a boy. We don't know this boy's name or anything about him, except that he was prepared to share all the food he had. So how amazing an experience for him to know that his small amount of food ended up feeding the mass of people. Maybe he even saw the miracle take place. And the lesson for us is that whenever a need arises, be it big or small, we need to hand over to Jesus all that we have and then let him do the rest. Now that doesn't mean we leave everything to Jesus and we do nothing ourselves. We need to do what he calls us to, but then leave the rest to him. It's also worth noting in verse 11 that Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. And he did the same with the fish. Now, Jesus could have performed this miracle himself. Instead, he demonstrated the importance of coming to the Father with our needs, depending on him for provision, and doing so to learn more about increasing dependence. Jesus wants us to learn that all good things come from the Father, and we should live our lives in thankful submission for his provision. How often do you remember to thank God for all 
the good things he blesses you with? How often do you just concentrate on the negatives? And is your thanking when you do thank him genuine? Or is it really just a token gesture? And we see John relating in verse 12 that Jesus tells his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. And 12 baskets are left over. You see, God provides an overabundance, far more than we expect or need. Notice that while there is abundance, though, there's no waste. All the extra is gathered up. In the same way, God provides us with an overabundance. And he doesn't want us to waste what he gives us either. Moving on to verse 14 tells us that after the people saw the sign that Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who has come to the world. Now the people have just had Jesus provide them with bread supernaturally. So it's not surprising that they connect Jesus with a prophecy from Moses found in Deuteronomy chapter 18, which is where this is coming from. In Deuteronomy, Moses says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. The people knew that the Lord through Moses had provided the people of Israel with manna or bread while they were in the desert. And so here was another man with great knowledge and great power also providing bread to the people. So the connection to Jesus being this prophet that Moses referred to is a natural one to make. The problem was that the people had a wrong image of who this prophet would be. They wanted a political leader who would rescue them from the rule of Rome. But that was totally contrary to Jesus' mission. And there was a deeper problem with this as well. Because what the people were doing was trying to make Jesus a king without going through the suffering of the cross. And if you remember, that was exactly what Satan tempted Jesus with as the third temptation in Matthew chapter 4. But Jesus knew the right way is the Father's way. Jesus' priority at all times was obedience to his Father's will. It's a priority that we so often forget to our great detriment. How often are you tempted with that shortcut that you know is not quite right? Being in the Father's will is not the easy way, but it is the right way. Jesus knew that, and so he withdraws to a mountain by himself to avoid being forcibly made a leader of this crowd. Now, the irony in all of this is that the disciples and the crowd missed the point that the miracle signified. The disciples in particular had seen the miracles of Jesus turning water into wine, healing the nobleman's son, and healing the crippled man. And yet, when it came to this current situation, they could not understand what Jesus is capable of doing. They appeared to have some sort of memory loss. Well, regrettably, we are no better. How often do we forget the great things that God has done in the past for us? And the moment we meet the next hardship, we're only looking at the practical, the physical, and we've totally forgotten about Jesus. 
Or if we do remember Jesus, how long does it take before we're complaining that he's not acting or he's not listening or he's not even present when we need him? But perhaps the biggest takeaway from this is how God uses the little things to display his glory. Because ultimately, God is glorified most when we don't have enough. The reality is that our offerings will only ever be insufficient. You see, we never have enough to be able to offer enough. But that is exactly what Jesus wants. Because he can make every meager offering abundant. And that's our first principle. Jesus' sovereignty makes our meager offerings abundant. Jesus' sovereignty makes our meager offerings abundant. Never think that you have nothing to offer. Never think that it's too small or too insignificant to make a difference. And remember, for Jesus to make something abundant, first we need to take the step of faith and actually offer it to him. Are you holding back the little that you have because you think it's insignificant? Then it will stay insignificant. But your little, with God's blessing, can be abundance. So are you willing to bring the little that you have your time, abilities, resources, and place them in the hands of Jesus. And then watch as he uses it to accomplish far more than you ever imagined possible. Jesus' sovereignty makes our meager offerings abundant. So we now move to verse 16, and it's now evening, and the disciples board a boat to get to Capernaum. Jesus is not with them because he had withdrawn to the mountains to escape the crowd. Now the Sea of Galilee is known for the strong winds that come up very suddenly due to its location and the geography of the surrounding land. So the disciples end up rowing against a strong wind in rough seas at night. Now God intentionally allows us into difficulties so that we learn through experience the truths about his faithfulness. And these in turn allow our faith to grow. In verse 19, we see when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on water, and they were frightened. So it seems the disciples didn't recognize Jesus. They thought he was some kind of apparition. But when he speaks to them, they do recognize him. In verse 20, Jesus says, It is I. Don't be afraid. When we face hardship, we also need to recognize Jesus' presence with us. Regrettably, the hard truth is that we don't learn much when times are good. It's the storms of life that we learn our best lessons. And we have this wonderful reassurance that Jesus gives us that as we struggle through these storms, he will come to us. He comes to us and comforts us with his presence. And he comes to us during the storm 
not after it's over. Just as the disciples experienced, we are assured that Jesus will be with us when we need him most. And we're also assured that he will never leave us. He will always be with us to help us through. And the greatest assurance is that because he's sovereign over all creation, there is no tragedy, no pain, no wound, no wrong that he cannot heal. He is the almighty creator and he triumphs over every situation. When we're in the middle of the storm and we are battered and bruised, we can feel that the reality that Jesus will triumph over it can seem impossible or a distant dream at best. And it's in those moments that our faith is tested. But it's in those moments that our faith grows and strengthens. So what storm are you currently in? What seemingly hopeless situation? Rest in the assurance that Jesus has come to you. He is with you. And he won't leave you. Put your faith in his faithfulness and know that he is at work to bring you through your storm. And Jesus announces, it is I, and the disciples recognize him. Likewise, he says the same to us so that we know clearly who he is the divine Son of God, the God of the universe who has absolute power over the universe. It's also important to pick up on the second part of what Jesus says. Don't be afraid. We all get discouraged as the storms of life batter us. Thoughts that no one cares or understands, no one is capable of helping, always bombard us. And we tend to paint a scenario for ourselves where the future is far worse than the present and the reality is it's never as bad as we imagine. But Jesus reminds us that he knows and he cares he is the God of all comfort. And he offers what no one else can. So have faith in him and put your fear aside. Verse 21 tells us, Then they, the disciples, were willing to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat reached the shore where it was heading. And this is what Jesus does. He provides a way through the storms that we face when we invite him into our lives. He sits alongside us. He brings us comfort. And he gets us to our final destination. So the disciples saw two miracles in one day that demonstrated without doubt that Jesus had sovereign power over creation. These miracles clearly pointed to the divine nature and power of Jesus. And you might have expected that this day would have changed the disciples from here on in. And yet, we know that they continue to fail to recognize who Jesus is 
and what he's capable of. And they continue to be amazed at what Jesus does. And before we criticize, we need to acknowledge that we are just the same. There is something about our faith that requires it be renewed every day. We so quickly forget what Jesus has done, and we need daily reminders. We need to focus on Jesus and remind ourselves of his character and his promises and what he's done in our lives. Daily, we need to immerse ourselves in the word of God and meditate on his character and nature. It's so important we need that daily quiet time with God to refresh ourselves in his presence. And when we do invest in these steps, we do renew our faith daily. And because as we renew our faith, we increase our trust in Jesus and what he can do. And as we do that, our faith in him builds also. Jesus is showing us that his sovereignty means that we can put our faith in his divine power to protect, to provide and to be present. And that's our final principle. Jesus' sovereignty means that we can trust in his power, provision, protection, and presence. Jesus' sovereignty means that we can trust in the four Ps, his power, provision, protection, and presence. It's so easy to get trapped into looking to the world for our needs. The world constantly tells us that we can find everything we need from it. Don't be fooled. What the world offers is transient and never fully satisfies. We need to look past what the world says and listen to what Jesus says. Only he who is sovereign can provide completely. Only the creator can completely satisfy. So don't trust the world. Trust the one who created the world. Jesus' sovereignty means that we can trust in his power, provision, protection, and his presence. Ultimately, miracles, yes, they're great, but they don't change hearts. They are signs. They are pointers. So don't get caught up in the miracle. Look to who the miracle points to to Jesus. You see, the lesson that the crowd and the disciples missed in these miracles and the lesson that we need to take is that if you want true and absolute security that you will be provided for, then your only option, your only option is to look to Jesus because only Jesus can provide all our physical and spiritual needs. Because Jesus' sovereignty makes him our complete provider. Let's close in prayer. Lord, what a reassurance you give us that in your sovereignty, you will always be present with us. 
that you will always provide what we need and that you will empower us in your work. So will you give us the faith to bring you the little that we can offer with the faith that you will make it abundant? And as we endure the storms of life, will you reassure us of your presence and guide us and help us to reach the other side and help us always to look to you to provide all that we need. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Have a great week.